thank you very much for inviting me here. And first of all, can everybody hear me? I have a very low voice. Wouldn't it be great? What I would like to do is I would definitely will give you an overview of financial aid, but what I'd like to do is make this a little bit more casual so it's just not me lecturing to you and providing with information. If you have questions, please feel free. And if I get off track, someone remind me where I was. Um, I'd be happy to answer as we go along. Also, I'd like to leave as much possible for your questions, which I then will su suspect will feed into some of the topics that I might have covered if I was giving a longer talk somewhere. The other thing I'd like to say to you is this, as Linda said, even though I'm going to talk about financial aid, the process of financial aid, what the family's expectations are of financial aid, what they might see on financial aid award letters, and as Linda said, what's really happening behind the scenes, because it varies at every institution. There isn't one set rule of how they're allocating financial aid. You're not supposed to be an expert. It really is something that our financial aid professionals, whose job it is at these financial aid offices, to answer questions for these students. There's all kinds of hotlines where students can call in. But at least you'll have an understanding of it. You can help them advocate for themselves and prompt them. We're going to talk about deadlines. We're going to talk about the appeal process. We're going to talk about things they should think about when they get their financial aid award. Even when I counsel people professionally, I never told them what to do. I more would ask the questions which would help them make the decision for them and their families because I know what I would do, but that's not necessarily what they would do. And then the other thing I'll say before I get going, and I'm not, I don't know this author nor do I make any money off this book. Um, this is one of the best financial books I've seen in a long time. If anybody hasn't seen this, and we're going to get, it's Making the Most of Your Money Now by Jane Bryant Quinn. It is fantastic, and if anybody does want to learn a lot about financial aid, or if you know someone who's trying to figure out how they're going to finance this in five or six years, especially upper income families, this is absolutely fantastic. It's very easy to read, and everything, every single thing it said about financial aid was correct. And in fact, she even tells you a lot about what's really happening behind the scenes, and gives you some really good advice for students coming up with those lists of colleges if they want to try to play the game of maximizing their financial aid. She has some excellent tips in here. So I just say that, I know, uh, let's get ready. He's probably going to buy this book. It's very heavy, and if anyone's trying to plan for retirement or anything else, it's excellent. The other thing, too, is um, as far as the websites we're going to talk about tonight, they're all in our financial aid, the book we got from Let's Get Ready, in the back of the financial aid section. All the links are there. Also on iMentor, the links are also there. So, you know, some of the things I mentioned, I won't rattle off the website because it's everywhere. Uh, but I just mentioned that because um, I'll, I'll be referring you to those areas. As Linda mentioned, the reason why it's good to mention the schools I worked at is Colby College is where I started. And way back then in, the, in 1980, that was back in the day when Colby admitted everybody based on their academics who qualified. But when you got to the financial aid process, needy students, some were funded, some were not. And in fact, they might be admitted, but denied financial aid. So Colby was interesting. Now, they've since changed a lot of their financial aid policies, which is also going to tie into things. Things can change as kids are at these schools as well. The financial aid packages can change as demands at these schools change. Hopefully for better. But I, I just say that in that case, Colby changed for the better. Students that were admitted were then given financial aid. But I started at Colby, and I ended up at the new school. And what's interesting about the new school is it's all different types of schools. I won't get into all the schools, but it's everything from Eugene Lang College, Parsons School of Design, Actors Studio, Joffrey Ballet, Manus Conservatory, the graduate faculty. Each of those schools had completely different financial aid policies. One university, and even within major, the financial aid policies varied depending upon how competitive the major was. These weren't things that we told the families applying for financial aid. This is how we awarded financial aid behind the scenes. And then when the students got their aid package, depending upon the school, it could be two, you know, same income, same assets, same grades, two completely different financial aid packages. That's why I say it's hard to give a hard and fast rule as to what to expect on a financial aid. Okay, so uh, that's my backdrop for that. Uh, but I want to say, well, no matter what happens with college education, right now it's still considered, uh, for kids that want to go, it's a good deal. 
over their lifetime earnings, supposedly 60% more income on average. So even as we talk about student loans, reasonable amounts of student loans, hopefully most of our students who go on and graduate will find that it's a good investment in their education, even if they do have loans they need to pay back. Okay? All right. Um, financial aid. Why do people apply? There are definitely people who apply who just want to see what they're eligible for so they can get a sense of, okay, if I don't want to cash out this fund or take out a home equity loan, what are my alternatives? Student loans, merit-based aid. Fine. But that's probably not the group we want to talk about tonight. Tonight's group is most likely going to be students who then, when they look online or they look at that catalog or they talk to someone, they see a cost of school that is so far beyond their ability to pay that it gives them angina. Okay? And I also want to distinguish between cost of education or cost of school and eventually when we talk about price of school. Okay? Quickly, cost of education, it's a term you see in financial Can the owner offices. of a gray GMC please come in? Thank you. <laughs> cost of education is thrown around. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the real cost of education. Cost of education is what colleges and universities put out to say, here's our tuition, here's our fees, typical room and board, uh, books, entertainment, transportation. This is typically what a typical student at this school and this program is going to spend at this school. If you don't need any financial aid and you're that typical student, you know, with two roommates or one roommate and you're, you're, you're eating on campus, that's probably going to be pretty good cost of education and price of education to you. But if you're somebody who cannot afford that and you're going to be applying for financial aid, that cost of education may be meaningless. What it really is going to come down to is how much free money are you going to get, which is going to lower that, that price to you as the student. And again, since I think a lot of us are dealing with students who probably come from low-income families, lower middle-income families, chances are they are going to see some financial aid, which is going to bring that price down completely different than a student that doesn't apply at all. Okay? So my first thing I want to say is as you're working with your students and they're working with their guidance offices and you're coming up with lists of colleges, I hope no one discourages someone who says we're poor, we have no money, from putting down you know, a college that may be very expensive for your private school because they may very well be getting some generous scholarship money from that institution. But at the same time, we want to make sure in those groups of, of colleges and universities, we have some very good public schools on there because just in case the financial aid packages are disappointing, they have an affordable alternative if they cannot afford to go to those private four-year colleges they might have listed on. Okay? Okay. How do you apply for financial aid? The primary way you apply <coughs> is on the federal application. It's free. It's called the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. The link is in your book. The link is on the website. Hopefully our students are relatively computer savvy because the quickest, most efficient way to apply for financial aid is online with the online FAFSA. Okay? What you're going to do if you went in there today, it's actually very, I think it's very clear. I went in today acting like I didn't know anything because I hadn't been on there in a while. Excellent instructions. It gives you uh, online worksheets which you can print, meaning that your, your students or your students' families, they can print off, that they can fill out the information, it tells them what to get together, tax returns, W-2s, bank statements, untaxed income statements, it's all in the instructions, it tells them to get it together, has them fill out a very simple worksheet. Now they're ready to sit in front of the computer and begin to fill out the online financial aid form. So there's even good worksheets to help them get ready so it's not too overwhelming at first. In addition to the online federal financial aid form, there's another section where they go in, and it's where they get a personal identifier number called a PIN. Again, back in the day, where I wasn't as familiar with the PIN as I am today, but it's, it's what they're going to use to access access their financial aid forms in the future online. It's what they're going to use if they want to electronically sign their financial aid forms. If they're not comfortable using this PIN to electronically sign their financial aid form, 
They can certainly print out a signature page. It's very clear in the instructions. Personally, it would be great if they all did electronic pins and their parents also did an electronic pin because it's faster. Julie, um, if I understand the system correctly, the student and the parent both need to register to get a PIN number, and they should just use the same number, right? I gather they can do that. Yes, yes. But the nice thing about the, and I'll throw that PIN number, that identifying number is, if you're online and you fill out the financial aid form and you feel comfortable electronically using this confidential number as your signature, in about one week, this financial aid form is going to turn around. It's going to go off electronically to a processor. If everything's good, the processor is going to look at all the different school codes the students listed on their application. The students decide what colleges they want to go to. They look them up. They put the code right on the application. Electronically, this data will get sent around to those financial aid offices in February. Does the FAFSA form come in Spanish? <laughs> yes. Yes. There's and there's all instructions on the website in Spanish as well. There's PDF instructions, both English and Spanish. Okay. The other thing too, by the way, I'm just saying online, just so you know, they can do anything they want in hard copy. You can get these forms, you can call. There's an 800 number on, in our books to call Fed Aid for the forms. <laughs> Libraries have them, the college financial aid offices have them, the guidance offices have them. But again, the downside of the paper form, it could take four or five weeks. And one of the things you're all going to find, which is why right now it's so critical, the earliest you can fill out these federal forms is January 1st, but you've got to fill them out, I'm referring to you almost like you're the students. I know it's not you filling them out. You need to fill them out relatively quickly because most of these financial aid offices have deadlines. They want financial aid information no later than February 15th, and some of them want it sooner. Under no circumstances do you want your students missing a financial aid deadline. I can tell you from just about every school I went to, if you did not file on time, you often missed out on institutional scholarships. Not the federal monies necessarily, but you would have gotten quite a bit more institutional scholarship if you hit the deadline. In some of the schools I was at, you see it changed after I was there, if you missed that deadline the first year, it cost you for the next four years. They treated you as a late filer. Now, I thought that was unfair and changed it to you as long as you filed on time from that point forward, but it's very important. And I apologize if this digresses, but the, the key thing about this is you're going to find uh, some families, and I know my um, a couple of students have told me their families have small businesses. They're not going to file that early. The parents will not be filing their income tax that early. That's okay. One of the options on here is to check estimated information. No matter what, they should check estimated information and get this thing in on time. Okay? What will happen later on, of course the financial aid office ultimately wants the actual information. They'll have that online PIN number. As soon as the tax returns are filed, they'll go in, they'll update the information, it'll get reprocessed, resent to the financial aid offices, and the only thing the students need to be aware is the financial aid award may change. Okay? Does the family have to go in to update it once they've completed that year's uh, yes, tax yes. As soon it's as not you, automatic. As soon, it's not automatic. No, as soon as, not yet. Um, as soon as the parent or guardian, I mean, whoever's filling out the fund, it could even be the student's tax return that's late. When, if they know they've done estimated information, as soon as those forms are filed, they should go back in, check the box, actual tax returns, update the information, send it electronically, and just be advised if they underreported their income, their financial aid award may go down. I mean, if they overreported their income, no, underreported. If they overreported their income, the financial aid could go up. Okay? And how do they do that if you get that detailed with them? Just think about what you would do if you had to estimate. If it's similar to last year, use last year's tax returns. If they have a W 2 and that's typically, they don't know their interest income yet or whatever, estimate. But the closer they 